Hello and welcome to our weekly look inside Syria. I'm Mike Hanna. The Syrian opposition has wrapped up its meetings in the Turkish city of Istanbul with a new president for the Syrian National Coalition. Is Ahmad al-Asi al-Jaba, a member of the Syrian National Council. The coalition has been without a leader for months after its head quit over disagreement about potential talks with the Syrian government. The new leader will need to present a united front for Syria's opposition and bring under control armed groups operating inside the country. He'll also be tasked with finding a strategy for possible peace talks that the US and Russia have been trying to convene in Geneva. And on the battlefield, fighting remains as fierce as ever. For almost a week now, government forces have pounded the city of Homs in an offensive to solidify government control. Rebels in Homs are still in control of some of the neighborhoods, but the government controls the rest of Syria's third largest city. Charles Stratford has this report. These videos reportedly show government forces supported by Hezbollah fighters attacking rebel positions in the city of Homs. Al Jazeera cannot verify the pictures uploaded onto YouTube, but they tally with reports from activists on the ground. The army and Assad loyalists control most of the city. Now the fight for the historic district around Khalid ibn al-Walid Mosque is intensifying. The UN's High Commissioner for Human Rights says between 2,500 and 4,000 civilians are trapped in areas of Homs where the fighting is most intense. With Russia and Western nations disagreeing over how to help, a divided UN Security Council again failed to approve a statement calling on the Syrian government to allow immediate access. Fighter jets repeatedly targeted rebel positions in the district of Irbin on the outskirts of the capital Damascus. In Istanbul, agreement among Syria's fractious opposition over who should lead the Syrian National Coalition was hard to achieve. After no candidate got beyond 50% of the first vote, tribal leader Ahmed al Asi al Jarba won a runoff. He has close ties with Saudi Arabia. The Syrian National Coalition's previous leader resigned after disagreements over the suggestion of peace talks with the Assad government. The organization's lack of unity has made Western and Arab backers reluctant to supply more advanced weapons to the rebels. And the Syrian regime is taking advantage of division in the opposition as pro-Assad forces step up their campaign against rebels in towns and cities like Homs. Charles Stratford for Inside Syria. Well, the opposition has been criticized for failing to unite ahead of planned peace talks in Geneva later this year. Back in March, the SNC was on the verge of collapse after its president, Ahmed Moaz Al-Khatib, offered his resignation only days before representing the coalition in the Arab League summit in Doha. Meanwhile, analysts say that the Syrian National Coalition has to become a unified opposition movement that achieves four critical and linked goals, including coordinating internal military action with the Free Syrian Army and working on transforming it into a national army with a high degree of discipline and combat readiness, generating legitimate and credible local governance bodies in areas liberated from government control, and getting the support of key minority groups including Alawites, Kurds, Druze and Christians, and also trying to convince them of their safety in a post-Assad Syria. Finally, managing the rising flow of international diplomacy and aid. Well, to assess the performance of the Syrian National Coalition, the challenges ahead and its future vision, we are joined by our guests. In Istanbul, Najid Gadban, representative of the Syrian National Coalition in the United Nations, and in London, Fawaz Gagez, director of the Middle East Center and a professor of international relations at the London School of Economics. Welcome to you both. Let's begin in Istanbul. We've heard the new president has been elected, but a very narrow margin of victory by some uh, three votes in the actual runoff. Uh, Ahmad Alassi al Jaba becoming the new president. Uh, Najid Gadban, does this narrow win indicate that there is still a degree of disunity within the coalition? Well, um, as you, uh, you know, stated, this is a coalition. 
uh, made up of uh, several factions, uh, blocks, uh, let's say about seven or eight. And um, when the election um, took place, there were four candidates and there was a second uh, round for the election in which, in fact, most participants had to choose between these two. So it was very close. I think when we have a close election, uh, it should indicate a, a great deal of uh, fairness in the process. Uh, but at the same time, it, there is a definitely a degree of polarization. Um, over again, really issues of uh, uh, tactical issues of the best way to achieve the objectives, not the goals of the Syrian revolution. Well, Fawaz Gagas in London, your view is there the does the coalition remain disunited? Well, I mean, uh, competition is very healthy. A small margin is a sign that uh, the Syrian National Coalition is acting in a democratic way. That's that's. I think electing a leader is not a major the major challenge facing the Syrian National Coalition. Uh, I think we need to talk about the structural constraints, the structural challenges, uh, not just the technical and political challenges. I mean, I think what we need to understand is that the Syrian National Coalition is being pulled and pushed in different directions by its regional and international patrons and powers. I mean, let's keep in mind that the context that the Syrian National Coalition is dependent on regional and international powers for military aid, for financial support. And this is a major, major structural constraints under which the Syrian National Coalition has been acting for a long time. The second point, and I think your guest in Istanbul has put it very aptly, is that there are serious and deep political and ideological and personality clashes uh, uh, within the Syrian National Coalition. And I think this is healthy as long as uh, they can be resolved. So far, I think the Syrian National Coalition has not been able or capable to really resolve these underlying uh, tensions. I think the big point to make is that uh, the challenge facing the coalition is to transform itself into a coherent, competent, effective uh, uh, governing uh, organizational body. Uh, we have to wait and see because I think the election of Mr. Ahmed uh, Ajarba does not really change the structural constraints because uh, uh, Mr. Ahmed uh, Muaz al Khatib was a, a very uh, a powerful, charismatic leader, yet he failed to make, to make a dent. Well, you mentioned, uh, in the Syrian National Council, I you, think. you mentioned, the, if, if, if I may, the uh, international constraints operating on the coalition. But what about the internal forces, Najid Gadban, uh, the degree to which the fighters on the ground feel themselves not sufficiently represented by their political leadership? How much of an issue is this within the coalition's operations and in the weeks and months ahead? Well, um, this is definitely one of the uh, major challenges facing the coalition, and that is to strengthen its relations to the free, you know, with the Free Syrian Army and with the various local councils, revolutionary councils that are, in fact, on the ground in the liberated areas, and they're providing some degree of governance. Um, but I could say that uh, uh, in the expanded um, uh, assembly uh, that's now 114, um, there was for the first time a representation uh, of the Supreme Military Council under the leadership of Salim Idris. Uh, this uh, group was represented by 15 members and so they took part, I think this was again uh, one way to strengthen that relationship. Uh, another group was added uh, in the expansion was the Revolutionary Councils. Those are, again, uh, some of them are still uh, working, pursuing peaceful uh, means, some of them uh, doing um, humanitarian assistance. Um, others are, in fact, engaged in the fighting against the regime. Uh, those, again, were um, represented by 14 members. Each came from a different province governorate in Syria. So, but, but this, is, this process, again, you know, still um, can, can be improved uh, tremendously. Now, I could say that the idea, if we are able to uh, push the idea of the interim government, that in fact there was a, a lot of work went into this, um, which would uh, provide the national uh, coordination for all of the work that the local councils, the revolutionary councils, SMC and other Free Syrian Army are doing on the ground, especially in the, in the li liberated areas. That kind of structural, I think, um, you know, um, body can, can be definitely strengthened. Uh, and, and then people on the ground would start to feel the impact 
uh, of, of the coalition. Well, Fawaz Gerges, your, your view on that, the uh, creation of an interim government, the possibility of it? Well, I think, uh, again, uh, I, I think of all the, the, the challenges facing the council is to uh, exert authority on the ground, is to forge a strategic links with the various uh, armed uh, groups uh, uh, all over Syria. Uh, the reality is to come back uh, to the structural constraints. There is a real divide between the armed factions on the ground inside Syria yeah, and the uh, political opposition in the diaspora. And this particular divide has not been uh, filled, as you all well know. And, and even though the supreme command of General Yusuf Adris has done a, a great uh, uh, um, campaign, uh, and in fact, I, 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 I'm not saying anything originally if I say that really the, the United States and the Western powers now are dealing directly, as you want to know, with General Yusuf Adris. They trust him a great deal. They think he is the real driver. They think that's really where the action is taking place. Um, uh, and this tells you a great deal about uh, uh, how ineffective, in a way, the Council has been in the sense of creating organic strategic links uh, on the battlefield inside Syria itself. Well, now, a major issue and a major point of division uh, through recent months has been the question of dialogue and the strategy to adopt with regard to dialogue attempts to get the Geneva II meeting underway from both the United States and the Russian. Uh, would the new leadership, uh, Najid Gadban, help this process get a greater degree of unanimity onto, as to how to approach the issue of dialogue? Um, well, uh, this is, uh, you know, one of the uh, most important, I think, uh, issues to be discussed uh, in the meeting, uh, you know, f uh, future meetings. And, and uh, uh, again, as I left, uh, there was still uh, the process of electing the political committee. Now it's being uh, expanded uh, from 9 to 19. Um, and uh, within this body, there will be a major uh, recommendation over how to deal with Geneva II. In principle, I would say that uh, most, I mean, the most politically oriented members of the coalition uh, support a political solution. And they see in Geneva II, in fact, something positive. That is, if we are going to implement Geneva I, which is creating a transitional government with full executive authority to uh, implement a democratic transition, in which, in fact, people like Assad and his likes would have no place in that process. So, uh, again, I think th there's no problem in terms of accepting um, that, that vision and, and, and trying to push it through. Uh, the, the difficulty uh, lies, I think, you know, f from two, actually, sources. Uh, the first one uh, is the fact that the regime continues to push very hard on the ground. And, you know, we know the situation now in Homs, before that, Al-Qusayr, and inviting foreign forces like Hezbollah, Iranian, and the continued, of course, Russian support to it, which, uh, you know, when I think this is being a, a major, in fact, contradiction. And it violates not only the spirit of Geneva one, but the letter of Geneva one. That is, if you're going to a political process, you should de-escalate. De and the second one uh, has to do, in fact, uh, with the, uh, again, um, uh, ability of various, uh, you know, countries, including our friends, to provide the kind of support to convince the Assad regime, in fact, to believe in a political process, because as long as they believe they can win, there will not be a political process. Well, while the talking and discussion and leadership changes are happening, the fighting is continuing on the ground. Syria's opposition is again urging international action to protect civilians in the cities of Homs and Dera. Certainly the situation in Homs is dire. The uh, destruction is, is uh, great and enormous. Uh, Fourteen neighborhoods are under siege right now. Uh, over 5,000 uh, families uh, are under siege. And, and certainly an immediate intervention to save these uh, civilians' lives is of great uh, importance. Well, Fawaz Gerges, the issue of the fighting on the ground and the reverses that have been suffered, it would appear, by the opposition forces in recent months, how much of an impact does the direction that that struggle is taking um, impact on the international efforts uh, to remove uh, the al-Assad regime through negotiation? Uh, tremendously. Uh, I think the reality is the dominant wisdom, uh, the dominant narrative on the Assad regime, as you know, has been turned upside down. Uh, 
the Assad government is not going anywhere. Uh, it has consolidated its position. It's on the offensive. Um, its major allies, Hezbollah and Iran and Russia, are fully committed. Uh, the Assad military machine is on the offensive. Uh, the battles now are in the heart of Homs, trying to basically uh, expand the government control to Homs itself. And I think the question of dialogue, as you suggested to uh, Mr. Ghadban, uh, will most likely be postponed. Because as you know, uh, there are major divisions uh, within the council about uh, the question of dialogue. And that's why uh, I don't think this particular question will be addressed and put on the table. And I think, uh, let me be blunt here, is that the Western powers, in particular the United States, uh, is of the opinion that uh, the so-called Geneva uh, uh, Second uh, will not take place before August or September, because the priority now is to change the balance uh, of power on the ground, to change the balance of terror on the ground, because there is a consensus uh, here where I'm sitting in London and, and Washington is that the balance of power has shifted in favor of the Assad regime. And thus, if you have a conference in July or August, uh, the Assad regime will not be, uh, would not be in a position, uh, receptive position to make any concessions. So uh, the priority now is for uh, the battlefield. And as you know, the Western powers have made a decision to arm the opposition. But here is the, here is the dilemma. What if the balance of power does not change in favor of the opposition. And I would go further. Even if the balance of power shifted tactically a bit in favor of the opposition, still the opposition has to confront a reality. And the reality is more than two years after the outbreak of the Syrian revolution, it was a political uprising turned into an armed struggle. And now it wars by proxies and international wars still has to sit down and talk to elements of the Assad government. This is the reality. It's not going to go anywhere. And well, I, think I'm, I, I think I fully agree with your guest in Istanbul that uh, uh, they, they have to address the question what to do, uh, the strategy, uh, uh, where do you go from here, given the stalemate. Because my take on it, this is a war of attrition, a long war that has done a great deal of damage and will most likely do more, more damage in the next few weeks and next few months. Well, Bashar al-Assad certainly uh, believes that he is solidly in place, remains in place. In a recent interview, he said very clearly that uh, his government has dealt with everything that's been thrown at him by the rebels, and he insists that the only way uh, the game can change is if there is direct foreign intervention, which he does not believe is going to happen. And uh, Najib Gadban, bearing all of this in mind, what is the next step if there is no way to uh, create a military victory on the ground? Um, I think this is uh, uh, likely to go on. Um, and uh, from our point of view, I mean, a lot of the uh, elements your guest, uh, Dr. Jerry, just mentioned, um, I, while I agree with, I might disagree with the interpretation of those factors. Uh, again, you know, you, you could say uh, differently that uh, two years into this, the Assad regime uh, failed to, um, you know, crack down and, and uh, basically defeat the opposition, that the Assad does not control more than 60 percent uh, of the territory, that actually the Assad regime is still working toward creating maybe a mini state uh, in certain areas and that explain uh, the focus on areas like Qusayr and Hamas and everybody knows that uh, there is you know some within the regime think of creating a family Alawite state third um, and and that I think the fact that they feel to invite groups like Hezbollah to make these victories does uh, address the question of uh, you know, weakness and vulnerability on the part of the even the elite unit within the Assad uh, regime. So, from our point of view, is that I think we should be always ready uh, to have a political solution that would fulfill the aspirations of the Syrian people who went into the street and started this revolution. Uh, but I think uh, we will do it by all means, including the military means. And I think we do welcome the uh, announcement by Western countries, including the U.S., to arm the opposition. I mean, this is totally unfair that the friends of the Assad, the three and a half countries, get give them all the, the, the weapons they need, all the political support, all the money. I mean, we heard, uh, you know, they're giving them about half a billion dollars a month uh, from Iran and other sources, while we're getting so little from our friends. So 
I think people are determined to go on all the way to achieve uh, their objective. I agree with Dr. Jus, this might take longer time, but people are not going back. I think this determination is clear on the ground, it's clear by all Syrians, and um, th while we're doing this, we keep the opportunity open for the other side, in fact, uh, to accept a notion of Assad. If Assad is no part of this picture, we could talk to them and, and it, you know, maybe reach some kind of a national reconciliation. Or well, a well we've been speaking about what Syrians are doing and what the coalition leadership is doing, but what about that issue? that you brought up there of um, arming uh, the uh, rebels within Syria. Uh, Saudi Arabia is doing so at present. Qatar is at present. However, not necessarily those specified weaponries, uh, weapons that are needed. Now, the supply of that, many believe, is being controlled directly by the Western nations, such as the United States, concerned about the idea of stinger missiles, which are essential, uh, says the opposition, falling to the hands of militant groups to be used against civilian air traffic in, in the future. I mean, Fawaz Gagas, we have a situation now where this is a complication too. There is not a united approach from those who say they wish to aid Syria and end this ongoing line of killings. You know, it, it, it is so painful for me uh, to reiterate the basic principle that we all know now, and I think Mr. Ghaddan probably knows this more than I do is that neither the United States nor the Western powers will provide uh, adequate, advanced, potent weapons to basically make a critical difference on the battlefield. The Western strategy, if I can summarize it in a very simplistic way, is to address the imbalance of power on the ground, to create a balance of terror. And, and this by itself is a testament to how complex and difficult the situation uh, so if you're providing arms uh, to the opposition only to basically uh, create a balance of terror, this tells me that uh, we're not going to see uh, any decisive victory on the battlefield either by the Syrian government or the opposition. And the reality is my fear, and I say it very in really painfully, is that this, the conflict is no longer between the opposition. Look, you and I and Mr. Ghaddan were talking about the Assad regime and the opposition. It is more about regional powers uh, battling each other inside Syria and international powers, the United States and Russia in particular, waging uh, a cold war, a hot war inside Syria itself. Well, and this very is briefly, why, if I ways, could, Najid Ghaddan, uh, could you respond to that, to that particular point that this is not just about the opposition and the Syrian government? Uh, no, I, I agree with Dr. Georges. It is, uh, I mean, becoming more of a regional slash sectarian and international war. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, the essence of this conflict, again, the people who are fighting this war are Syrians. Um, yes, there are, again, more maybe uh, incoming uh, uh, now increasingly support from, you know, for the Assad regime from uh, Hezbollah, Iran, and Revolutionary Guards, etc. But the, 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 that, I think, element of it uh, is, is clear. I mean, you know, the, the, the objective of it, from our point of view, is to lead to some kind of political change. And I think that's why um, it's, uh, you know, the there are ways to do this, to pursue this. There are, you know, a prospect of a political solution to it, which was presented long time ago, you know, like through the Arab League. Uh, uh, but the, any, any uh, element of the solution must include some degree of accountability for those who committed crimes against humanity, against Syrian people, and that's Bashar al-Assad and some of his generals. I think if we're able to find a way to get these individuals out of the picture, we could find other solution, and we don't have to fight this war for so long. But I do agree with, again, with Dr. Georges that it is complicated because of the regional and international dimension of it. Um, and I think this is, you know, we always, uh, in fact, should ask our friends uh, to um, take responsibility. I mean, you know, w whether they will allow uh, Syria to, to be a failed state, whether they will allow Syria to become a totally subjected to the Iranian and in, in this kind of, you know, access in, in the region. Um, and uh, in fact, this is, this is a formula for creating instability in the region. So overall, I think uh, we have more friends uh, but what we're asking of them is, in fact, to provide the necessary support that can, we, can lead us to some solution, military or otherwise. Well, many challenges awaiting the new leadership of the Syrian coalition. Thanks to our guests in Istanbul, Najib Gadbian, in London, Fawaz Gerges, and thank you for joining us. Remember, Al Jazeera has extensive coverage of what's going on in Syria. 
not just on this program, but in our news broadcasts and online at aljazeera.com. I'm Mike Hanna. Thanks for watching Inside Syria. Goodbye for now.